Well, welcome, brothers and sisters. It's good to be here this morning, and we greet you in the name of uh, Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be with you from them. Uh, it is good to uh, have this opportunity to worship together uh, this morning, uh, draw away from a world that's full of turmoil. And we can now focus on our God. We can worship him and, and receive from him the blessing, uh, the benediction of our soul as we offer him worship that he is due. So we join you uh, not to uh, just to view, uh, not just to hear, but to engage yourself uh, in worship of our great God and enjoy him and bless him and honor him uh, this morning. God bless you. This morning we're going to sing Crown Him with Many Crowns. The lyrics have been provided for you and we'll sing all four verses. morning we have the privilege of reading the word of God uh, from our Lord's Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon ever preached. It is Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 through verse 20. Hear the reading of the living word of God. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, 
not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray together. Gracious God, our Father, we bow before you today with thanksgiving and gratitude in our hearts as believers. For you worked in us, and you grant grace to us, and we're now in your kingdom. And we give you glory for that. We thank you that we can serve you now in these days. We pray that you help us to live in ways that are pleasing to you, demonstrating our loyalty to you by how we live in the world. Lord, we pray for this time together this morning that it will meet the need of your people, solidify them, strengthen them. We pray uh, that those who watch, who are without Christ, who are not in the kingdom, we pray you grant them the grace of repentance and the grace of faith, that they may embrace the Lord Jesus Christ and join with the course of those who crown him Lord of all and adore him, not only now, but for endless days to come. So, Lord, we commit this time together to you. Thank you for your goodness to us this past week, and we look forward uh, to the, this week uh, as you direct us and bless us. In the name of Christ, I pray, amen. <laughs>
church can say amen. We are grateful to God for the privilege of being here, this respite from the world of woe, coming together uh, as we are and as have we been, as we have been since March uh, to worship God together and hear from his word. We're in John chapter 17 this morning, John chapter 17 beginning at verse 6. I want to uh, read those verses and then attempt by the grace of God to exposit them for our edification this Lord's Day morning. John 17, beginning at verse 6. I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words which you gave me I have given to them, and they received them and truly understood that I came forth from you. And they believe that you sent me. I ask on their behalf, I do not ask on behalf of the world, but of those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all things that are mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. Let's stop there in our reading of the word of God. Let us pray. Our Father, we pray you open the word of God to us this morning. Feed our souls. Grant us insight uh, that we may know our Lord Jesus better. Glorify him and you because of it. We pray these things in his exalted and glorious name. Amen. Jesus prays for his own. Uh, this high priestly prayer by our Lord Jesus Christ is about you, and it is for you. Yes, it originally pertained to the first disciples, but the truths it contained are apply to all Christians, all generations. We know this because of Jesus' statement in this very chapter in verse 20 when he says, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word. That text includes us. So in this prayer, we see what Jesus desires for his own even today. Our Lord uttered this prayer after he and the disciples shared the Passover meal together. And immediately before he went to Gethsemane, Judas, the betrayer of our Lord, had already departed to sell Christ for 30 pieces of silver. And may I add that that was the worst transaction of all time and eternity. So on his way to Gethsemane, the Lord Jesus Christ prays aloud in the hearing of his disciples. In these verses, he prays for his own. How are the, his own known? Verses 6 through 8 discloses how you can know who belongs to Jesus Christ. We identify these verses with the heading, the identification of his own. In verse 6, we start there. I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. That's the first one. In marketing practice, a company creates a name, a symbol, or a design that is easily identifiable as belonging to that company. It is called branding. Some examples, let me give you a couple or three. Nike. Everybody knows a Nike product because of the swoosh. McDonald's. You don't have to say McDonald's. All you have to say is the Golden Arches. If you have an Apple computer, you can be watching television. You can see a movie, and they'll have an Apple computer. You know it's an Apple computer because you see the Apple with the bite taken out of it. All of these things identify those products. Uh, that's branding. Believers are spiritually branded, too. 
several elements distinguish us from non-Christians. And uh, these elements that one I just read in verse 6 identify us as belonging to Christ. The first one I read, the Father's name has been manifested to believers. Manifested, that term there, translates the Greek word phanerao. Phanerao connotes to reveal, to make known. And what does Jesus make known? He makes known the Father's name, i.e., his character, his attributes. Put it like this, who he is, what he does, and what he expects. The Father to know what the Father requires, to know who he is, what he respects, uh, expects, requires divine disclosure. It cannot be grasped by the finite mind. There must be a divine unfolding of who he is. Jesus said in Matthew 11, verse 27, listen to him. He said, all things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Uh, That's profound. People do not know who the Father is. They do not know who the Son is apart from divine impartation of that knowledge. Men cannot discover with their finite minds, they cannot grasp the infinite person of God apart from God himself making himself known. By the way, as believers, he's manifested his name to us. That is grace. That is grace. Because he did it, because he willed, because we belong to him. It's grace. Jesus, in fact, is the revealer par excellence. In John's prologue, this very gospel, he uh, tells us about our Lord Jesus Christ, his revelatory work. In John chapter 1, verse 18, when he says, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. You can't see God. You can't see his essence. You can't behold him with your senses. But the only begotten God, that is the uh, one and only, that's what begotten really means. Monogonese is the word in the original, the unique God, the second person of Trinity, he's in the bosom of the Father, intimacy that's there. He has explained him. He's explained him. The word explain comes from a Greek word, exegeomai, and exegeomai means to interpret, it means to unfold, it means to lead out. Our word, our English word, uh, exegesis comes from the word translated explain there. Jesus, God in human flesh, explained or interpreted God to us. How did he do it? I'll tell you how he did it. He did it by all that he taught and all that he is. In fact, uh, to know Jesus, (laughs) to know him, see him, to understand him, his teaching is to know the Father and what he is like. John chapter 14, um, Jesus said, if you had known me, you would have known my father. Also, from now on, you know him and have seen him. And then Philip, in verse 8, said to him, Lord, show us the father. It's enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been so long with you? And yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the father. How can you say, show us the father? Jesus, in his ministry, as he worked, as he taught, uh, he did miracles. All those things was a demonstration of the Father. His, his character was on display in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So one way we know who Jesus' is, own are are those whom the Father has been revealed. He's, his name has been manifested to them. That's what verse 6, that part I read, I have manifested your name. And then we follow with these words of our Lord Jesus, um, he says, to the men whom you gave me out of the world. This is another distinguishing mark, our, our branding of Christians. 
like the disciples, the 11 who are there now, the true uh, believers, we are gifts to Christ from God the Father. You see it there? It says, you gave me out of the world. We are gifts by divine decree, the divine decree of election. Because we are, G G John said of Jesus, Jesus' words in John chapter 6, verse 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. Those who come to Jesus Christ are those whom the Father gave him in eternity past, Ephesians 1, 4. You're a Christian this morning. The reason you came because the Father in eternity past had given you to Jesus Christ. We heard the gospel. The 11 heard the gospel because God the Father had given them in eternity past, and we've been given to the Father and uh, the Son by the Father in eternity past. We heard the gospel in history, and we believe the gospel. We're gifts from the Father to the Son. Jesus said in John 6, 37, uh, who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. The reason he says this is because Jesus will not cast out the gift of believers from the Father. Do you think Jesus is going to repudiate the gift that God the Father has given to him? No, not at all. True saving faith, get this point, will never be exercised in vain. Never, ever. Gifts from the Father, and we're his forever. And those who come to Jesus are the recipients of eternal life. You can see that in John 17, verse 2. As he is praying about himself, how the Lord is, in the first five verses, he says, even as you gave him, verse 2, all authority, he's speaking of himself in the third person, over all flesh to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. So those that the Father has given to Jesus come to Jesus by faith, and Jesus gives them eternal life. Now, let me uh, say it like this. All true Christians are redeemed, redeemed humanity, people whom Jesus would die to redeem. Redeemed humanity will serve him and worship him for all eternity. That's who we are. When you, you think about yourself as a Christian, understand that's who you are. You're a gift from God, the Father, Jesus Christ, and we will worship and serve him forever and ever and ever. It's who you are. See, when you know what God is doing, you see, we're really caught up in this reality. The Father loves the Son, and the Son loves the Father, and the Father in his love said to the Son, I'm going to give you a gift of redeemed humanity, and he's given the Son us. It's not just that we won't go to hell. <laughs> it's just we're gifts to glorify him forever. By the way, we're going to look like him. That is, we'll be like him. When we see him, we'll see him as he is. We'll be instantly transformed into his likeness. So all of us, for all eternity, will look like him, worship him, serve him, and glorify him. Redeemed humanity. That's what Jesus is praying about. Now, he had to get us. The Father gave out us to him out of the world. You'll notice there in this part of verse, Verse 6, you gave me out of the world. Uh, we were once part of the world. World defines those who belong to the satanically energized and directed system comprised of unregenerate people who are hostile to and in rebellion against God. It's the world. Unregenerate people who are following Satan. Energized by him, hostile to God and rebellion against God, hate God, Romans 8 says, and elsewhere. It's the world, the world system. According to Ephesians 2, verse 1, they walk according to this world. 
according to the prince of the power of the air, i.e. Satan. And it's from that domain, the domain of darkness, this, this domain of systemic evil, the Father rescued us. Colossians 1.13, the domain of darkness, and he transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. That's what he did. All this marked us. This is who we are. How do you know you belong to Christ? That's what Jesus is praying about. It's identifying us. Now you notice, Jesus further identifies us. Verse 6, they were yours, and you gave them to me. This is speaking of ownership. They were yours. Yours how? First, by creation. Psalm 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness therein, and those who dwell in it. He created us. He, he is our owner. But for believers, there's another aspect to this. It's ownership by election. Acts chapter 18 brings this point out clearly. This idea of ownership by election. Paul is in Corinth. He is preaching there, sharing the gospel in that city. And he had success. People came to faith in Christ. And in verse 9, it says, there was, uh, Paul was afraid because of the disruption that occurred. And people were and, uh, had animus toward the gospel. And the Lord said to Paul, in the night by a vision. Listen to this, verse 9. Do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and do not be silent. For I am with you, and no man will attack you in order to harm you. Now, do I want you to know the Lord here is talking, that's Christ. But here's the point. This is what I want to get at. Notice it says, for I have many people in this city. Let me tell you who those many people were. Jesus said, keep on preaching because the people in the city, I have many of them, they are the elect ones, and your preaching of the gospel is going to bring them to Christ, to me. They weren't saved yet, but had been elected to salvation. Ownership by election. It's one reason why we know that the gospel is not a fool's errand. We're not going out sharing the gospel hoping somebody can be convinced by our compelling, cogent argument. We know that God has his people everywhere. And we just broadcast the seed of the gospel and the elect will come to Christ. It's certain. Because God determined that in eternity past. God is not sitting up in heaven talking about, please, 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 pretty please, come to me, please. He is not some helpless deity hoping that people will look to Christ. No, God has already determined the plan of redemption was settled in eternity past, and he's going to bring his people in because he's given a gift of people to Christ, and in eternity future, all of those he'd given eternity past will worship and serve Jesus Christ. This is a divine operation. This is not some mere human enterprise. It's a divine operation where God is working out his plan, even now. So that's the issue. That's the divine side. Let's look at the human side. There's a response. The, those who have been uh, chosen, they do respond. There's a responsibility of human beings to respond. And we see it here as our Lord prays, continues in verse 6. The last clause in verse 6. And they have kept your word. In a word, obedience. Initially, they kept his word by believing the gospel. And subsequently, obedience to what Jesus taught. But you notice something here in this verse. 
and it says, they have kept your word. Uh, talking to the Father. They've kept your word. Where do you, where'd you get the word? Where'd the word come from? I can tell you where it came from. I don't have to guess. You don't have to guess. Jesus says in 826 of John's gospel, I have many things to speak and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true, and the things which I heard from him, these I speak to the world. Where did Jesus get his word? He got him from the Father. So what Jesus says is what the Father told him to say. That's why he says here, they have kept your word. Jesus is not done identifying us as he identified the 11. Chapter, uh, verse 6 of chapter 17. Now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you. I uh, just mentioned additional identifying marks of Jesus' own. At that time, that word now there, at that point, they had come to a deep conviction that Jesus was God's messenger and that he did everything according to his Father's will. They understood that deeply. They didn't know everything, but what they did know at that juncture in their spiritual pilgrimage, they had a deep conviction. In fact, they would know more as the Holy Spirit came the day of Pentecost and taught them and deepened them, but at that point, they were settled. They knew, as Peter said earlier, you have the words of eternal life. Where shall we go? They knew that. They knew he'd come down from heaven. They knew all of these things, and they had a subtle conviction about who he is. And this was in contrast to the Jewish religious leaders who blasphemy said about Jesus as they observed him, uh, his miraculous powers, they claimed that he operated by Satan's power. Matthew chapter 12. That's the assessment of unbelievers. Unbelievers always misrepresent, misunderstand who Christ is. True believers, we know the truth about Jesus. We get it, not because we're smart, but because it's been revealed to us. It's a gracious action of our God. Verse 8, for the words which you gave me, there it is, I have given to them. And they received, and they truly understood that I came forth from you, and they believed you sent me. As we look at this reality, disciples believed that Jesus' words were true, and they believed they came from God. John 14, 26 is a place, one of the places to jot it down. Look at it later. You'll notice a couple of words here, received and believed. They received the truth about who Christ is, and they believed in his divine mission. They also <laughs> believed, in, as we do, th that Jesus' his origin was not earthly. Not earthly, he's not a man like us. Yes, he's a fully a man, but he's not a man like us because there's something distinctly different about him from us. I think you already know that. Yes, he's fully man, but he's more than a man. For you think about it, all of us, we had our origin here in space and time. There was a time when we were not. Not so with Jesus. John 6, verse 38, for I have come down from heaven. That's a stunning statement. Don't you say that. Lest we have to really pray for you. But Jesus could say, for I have come down from heaven. He says, my origin is not earthly. My origin is divine. I left heaven, came down here. Not to do my own will but the will of him who sent me. He was sent. The implication that he was there with the Father, and the Father said, Son, go. And Jesus came. 
So we understand that. And that's why he says, these men truly understood that I came forth from you, and they believed that you sent me. And that's what Christians believe. We understand that. We're not ambivalent about his origins. That's why we don't put him on the par with other religious leaders. Because he's not like them. That's why we do not compromise. We do not capitulate and say, oh, well, we all believe in the same God. No, we do not. Our God is triune. And the second person of Trinity, who existed eternally, came down here as a man, not surrendering his deity. He couldn't do that. He's the God-man. It's unique. There's no one like him. So we can't put him on the par with anybody. We have to stand firm for the exclusivity and uniqueness of Jesus Christ, right? That's who he is. And we believe that. We know that because of his revelation to us. Now, we've seen the identification of his own, the intercession for his own. We begin that in verse 9. I ask on their behalf. I do not ask on behalf of the world. Let's stop there for a moment. Jesus' intercession here is exclusively for the disciples, the ones who had been given to him by the Father, the ones to whom he had given eternal life. He is praying for them. He's interceding for them, intercession, bring a passion, on, uh, uh, um, a petition on behalf of another. By the way, this is what the ascended Lord is doing for us, even now. According to Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, it says, Therefore he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. The Lord Jesus Christ is interceding for In fact, this prayer is a preview of his intercessory work as a high priest for his people. Now, you might ask, Jesus denies that he's praying for the world. He says, I'm not praying for the world. He, doesn't, he didn't intercede for the world. But that does not mean that the world is beyond the love of Christ and the love of God course we know that's not true because actually in John chapter 3 verses 16 and 17 we understand that God loved the world and Jesus came not to judge the world but to save the world there are other verses like that moreover Christ in the Sermon on the Mount teaching us how we are to live in this world among unsaved people he said in Matthew 5 44 pray for those who persecute you People in the world who persecute Christ's followers, pray for them. Our Lord exemplified it at the highest degree when he was suffering the agony of crucifixion. He prayed for his crucifiers. He said in Luke 23, 24, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. Those men were people in the world. Therefore, the exclusivity of Christ's intercession here does not mean categorical, categorical exclusion regarding prayer for the world of lost men and women. We can pray for them. But here, Christ is praying for his own. His interest is for them. Why? Because they're the ones who are going to carry out the mission. Verse 20, I do not ask on behalf of these alone but for those who believe in me through their word. That's why he's praying. They're going to share the word, the gospel, the 11. The people are going to come. So Jesus is praying for them because of the mission they're going to carry out. That's why we're here today. Why are you there? Praise for his own. Not only that, he's praying for his own. In verse 23 of John 17, in his continuing prayer, he says, I and them and you and me, that they may be perfected in unity so that, now get this, that the world may know that you sent me. Isn't that amazing? 
preach their unity. He's praying for them because their unity will demonstrate to the world that the Father sent the Son. That's why he's praying for them. Then further in the verse, we're looking at verse 9, says, but of those whom you've given me, for they are yours. They are yours. Mm. They belong to the Father. They're, you, they're yours, Father. You say, oh, but I thought the Father had given them to the Son. Yes, that's true. But we still belong to the Father. Illustration, hopefully, help you. A mother gives birth to a baby and hands him over into the arms of the child's father. The baby still belongs to the mother. He also belongs to the father. Yes, the father has given us to the son, but we still belong to the father. We belong to the father because of election. We have been adopted in his family. Galatians 4, 5, Ephesians chapter 1, 5. We are the adopted sons and daughters of God. In fact, the whole trinity, we belong to them, each member. Our ownership by God is signified by our having been sealed with the Holy Spirit of salvation, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. The sealing there, one of the meanings is he indwelt us, or that's what it means, he indwelt us. Sealing means he owns us. God owns us still. Jesus Christ, who paid the price for us, he prayed, paid the price to redeem us. We're not our own. We were bought with a price. 1 Corinthians 6.20. So all of this puts it in perspective is just to who we are and why he's interceding for us. Verse 10a. As we move along here, it says, And all things that are mine are yours, and yours are mine. Oh, <laughs> are you kidding me? You better be God to say something like that. Jesus continues the theme of ownership. He says, like this. Let me put it in the way I would like to express it. What God owns, I own. I'm an equal owner of what God the Father owns. Now what this is, this is a claim to deity and equality with the Father. No mere creature can legitimately make this kind of claim. Such an assertion by a mere creature is utter blasphemy. Jesus' statement here is saying, I, I am equal to the Father. Martin Luther, great reformer, he uh, understood the significance of our Lord's statement here. And this is what Luther said about it. Quote, everyone may say this, and this is what everyone may say, what Luther is saying, that all we have is God's. But this is much greater, what Jesus says, that he turns it around and says, all that is thine is mine. This no creature is able to say before God, the word, all that is thine is mine, leaves nothing whatever excluded. Are all things his? Then the eternal deity is also his. Otherwise, he could not and dare not use the word at all. End of quote. Yes. It's a declaration of deity. In fact, the Gospel of John is clear on who he is. It opens up telling us who he is. The other Gospel writers affirm it. The, gos the epistles affirm it. The, apoc uh, the apocalypse affirms it. It runs throughout the entirety of Scripture, New Testament, Old as well, who he is. An inescapable reality. B portion of verse 10, and I have been glorified in them. And this is what we all are to do. Glorify Christ. That's our purpose. That's our reason for existence. 
It's to glorify Christ. It's to glorify God. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whatever you do, eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. Uh, and that's amazing. The simple stuff like eating, that's mundane stuff. Eating and drinking, you do even that to the glory of God. Why we In fact, the whole of existence is to bring God glory. That's what it's all about. It is not about us. It's about him. And we're going to glorify Jesus. I've already alluded to it, and I'll say it again. We're going to do it for all eternity. Redeemed humanity will worship and glorify Christ. That's what we'll do, and that's what he's praying about. He's praying about us. Identifying us here and praying for us. Let me uh, come to uh, an end of this. Others may and do pray for us, and we're really thankful for the prayers of our fellow saints. We bless God for them interceding for us. But none can pray for us like Jesus. He is the incomparable intercessor. The world and its lust is passing away, but we eternally belong to Christ. And I'm going to tell you, the joyful thing is he will bring us safely home to the Father's house. One day we'll stand before the Father, before the presence of his glory, as Jude says, blameless and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now, and forever. Amen. Let us pray. God, our Father, we thank you for the preservation of your truth, the pages of Holy Scripture. Thank you that we who are redeemed belong to Christ. Thank you for all the wonderful animate our lives for the glory of Christ, for our joy. We pray these things in his name. Amen. If you're here and you're not a Christian, you're listening to me, you're not a Christian, we invite you to give your life to Jesus Christ. You say, well, I don't know if I was elected or not. That's not your business. You just come to him by faith. Your response, your responsibility is to respond in faith. Trust him. Trust him today. He will receive you, the Savior who was raised from the dead after dying for sinners. He will welcome you and forgive you, give you eternal life and eternal future with him in heaven. May God help you to do so. Until next time, brothers and sisters, we look forward to sharing again with you from the word of God.